Hi everyone, this is Professor M. Science, and today I want to talk about Dirac notation in state space. This is another video in our series of rigorous quantum mechanics. State space is the name that we give to the vector space in which quantum systems live. Just like Euclidean space is the name that we give to the vector space in which we describe classical physics. State space is a bit different to the usual Euclidean space. Rather than having three dimensions, it can have more dimensions. In fact, it can have infinite dimensions. Another difference is that vectors in state space are not described by real numbers, they're described by complex numbers. But there are also some similarities. We want to be able to describe operation on vectors in both Euclidean space and state space, so in both spaces we define a scalar or inner product. A vector space equipped with an inner product is something we call a Hilbert space. Describing operations in state space is made simple by a notation first introduced by Paul Dirac, one of the founders of quantum mechanics. In this Dirac notation, we use names like kets, bras, and brackets that you may have heard about. So in this video, I want to introduce state space, the vector space in which quantum systems live. I will draw an analogy between state space and the familiar three-dimensional Euclidean space. And I will also introduce Dirac notation to describe vectors in state space. So let's get started. State space is the space in which quantum systems live, and therefore you can imagine it is fundamental in the study of quantum mechanics. Indeed, it features in the very first postulate of quantum theory. This postulate tells us that the state of a physical system is characterized by a state vector, and that this state vector belongs to a complex vector space V, which we call the state space of the system. This postulate tells us that the mathematical framework in which quantum states live is a vector space, so let's start by getting a refresher about vector spaces. To do that we're going to draw an analogy between a familiar vector space, the Euclidean three-dimensional space R3, and this new state space V that we have introduced to describe quantum systems. When drawing this analogy we're also going to introduce Dirac notation, which is a very convenient notation in which to describe vectors in state space. We write down an element of the Euclidean three-dimensional space R, and we call this element a vector, and by analogy we write down the element of state space as vertical bar psi right angle, and we call it a ket within Dirac notation. The letters r and psi are simply labels that allow us to identify the specific vector that we're working with, and they encode all the information there is to know about those vectors. For example, r tells us the spatial coordinates of a three-dimensional point, and psi typically contains the necessary information to describe the quantum system of interest. This could be, for example, the energy and momentum of our system. A vector space has two defining properties. The first one is vector addition, and the second one is scalar multiplication. If we start with vector addition, we can write the sum of two vectors, r1 and r2, which gives us a third vector, r3, which also belongs to the Euclidean three-dimensional space. Similarly, we can write the sum of two kets, psi1 and psi2, as giving us a third ket, psi3, which also belongs to the state space. Vector addition is commutative, so r1 plus r2 is equal to r2 plus r1, and we have an equivalent expression in terms of kets in state space. Vector addition is also associative, which means that r1 plus r2 plus r3 is equal to r1 plus r2 plus r3, and similarly we can write this down in state space. There is an identity for vector addition, which is the zero vector, such that zero plus r is equal to r, and the equivalent expression in state space is zero plus psi equals psi, where the identity in vector addition for the state space is called the null ket. Finally, vector addition has an inverse, so r plus its inverse gives us the zero vector, and similarly a ket plus its inverse gives us the null ket. The second defining property of vector spaces is scalar multiplication. What scalar multiplication tells us is that we can take a scalar a and multiply it by a vector r, and the result is also a vector that belongs to r3. And similarly, we can take scalar a multiplied by a ket psi, and the result is also a ket that belongs to the state space. Scalar multiplication is associative, which means that a times b times r is equal to a b times r, and similarly in state space. It is also distributive in scalar sums, which means that a plus b times r is equal to a r plus b r, and similarly in state space. And scalar multiplication is also distributive in vector sums. So a times r1 plus r2 is equal to a r1 plus a r2. And of course, similarly, we have the expression in state space. 
Finally, we have the identity for scalar multiplication, which is 1, such that 1 times r is equal to r, and 1 times psi is equal to psi. So that's it for the refresher on vector spaces, where we have compared the familiar Euclidean three-dimensional space to the newly introduced state space where quantum systems live. Now that we have defined the vector space in which quantum systems live, we want to be able to manipulate the vectors in this space in order to describe physical phenomena. One important structure that we're going to associate with state space is the scalar product. And what we're going to do again is to first introduce the scalar product in the context of the familiar Euclidean three-dimensional space. The scalar product, Sp, between two vectors R1 and R2, gives us a scalar C, which is a real number, and another way in which we typically write the scalar product in the three-dimensional Euclidean space is in terms of the dot product R1 dot R2. The scalar product comes with a number of properties, and the first one is conjugation. This name may not seem obvious to start with, but it will become clear later on in this video. Conjugation tells us that the scalar product between R1 and R2 is equal to the scalar product between R2 and R1. We can also write that in terms of the dot product as R1 dot R2 equals R2 dot R1. The second property is linearity. In the second argument, that tells us that the scalar product between R1 and A R2, where A is a scalar, is equal to A times the scalar product of R1 with R2. And again, we can write it down in terms of the dot product. In the first argument, linearity becomes scalar product of A R1 R2 is equal to A and the scalar product of R1 and R2, with again an equivalent expression in terms of the dot product. And finally, linearity also tells us that the scalar product between R1 and R2 plus R3 is equal to the scalar product between R1 and R2 plus the scalar product between R1 and R3. We can similarly write this down in terms of dot products. The final property of the scalar product is positivity, which tells us that the scalar product of a vector with itself is larger or equal to zero. We can again write this down in terms of the dot product, or in terms of the absolute value squared of the vector. Positivity also tells us that the scalar product of a vector with itself is equal to zero if and only if the vector itself is equal to zero. After this reminder about the scalar product in the usual Euclidean three-dimensional space, we're now ready to move on to the scalar product in state space. The scalar product sp between psi and phi gives us a scalar c, and in this case the scalar is a complex number because state space is a complex vector space. This highlights a crucial difference between the Euclidean three-dimensional space, which is a real vector space, and state space, which is a complex vector space. This difference will now become obvious when we look at the properties of the scalar product in state space. Conjugation tells us that the scalar product between psi and phi is equal to the scalar product between phi and psi complex conjugate. And now this clarifies why this property is called conjugation. If we now go to the second property of the scalar product, we realize that the scalar product in state space is linear only in the second argument. This can be seen in the first expression, and also in the second expression. If you remember, the scalar product in the Euclidean three-dimensional space was linear in both the first and the second arguments, but here we're specifying that the scalar product in the state space is linear only in the second argument. Why is that? The reason for that is because if we combine conjugation with linearity in the second argument, we arrive at a new condition, which depends on the first two, so we call it 2 prime, and this condition tells us that the scalar product in state space is anti-linear in the first argument. To see that, let's write scalar product of a psi phi, we then use conjugation to write it down as the scalar product of phi a psi star, we then use linearity in the second argument to write it down as a star scalar product of phi with psi star, and then we use conjugation again to write it down as a star scalar product of psi with phi. So we see indeed that if the scalar is in the first argument, to take it out of the scalar product, we actually need to calculate its complex conjugate, and that's why we call it antilinear in the first argument. The final property, positivity, is easier to carry through from a real to a complex vector space. The scalar product of a ket with itself is a real number that is larger or equal to zero, and it is equal to zero if and only if we have the null ket.
So what we have seen is that the scalar product in the state space is quite similar to the scalar product in the Euclidean space, with the main difference arising because we have a complex vector space. To introduce the next idea I want to tell you about, I want to revisit the scalar product in the Euclidean three-dimensional space. If I write it down as a dot product, r1 dot r2 equals c, then r1 and r2 appear to both be vectors in the vector space. But you also know that we can write the scalar product in the usual Euclidean three-dimensional space as a matrix multiplication. In this case, the scalar c is simply x1, y1, plus x2, y2, plus x3, y3. Now when we write the scalar product in this form, the two terms in the scalar product actually look different. The first one we usually call a row vector, and the second one we usually call a column vector. What is this telling us? We know that we cannot add a row vector to a column vector, and therefore vector addition is not properly defined between row vectors and column vectors. This must mean that they belong to different vector spaces, because vector addition is a defining property of a vector space. This difference between the two elements in the scalar product is not always discussed when discussing a Euclidean three-dimensional space, because when written in terms of the dot product, it is not obvious that R1 and R2 are actually different. However, this distinction is very important when we consider state space, and that's why I want to make it here. What we're going to say from now on is that the column vector belongs to the vector space, whereas the row vector belongs to the dual space. And in this way, we're going to distinguish between these two different vector spaces. If we want to be a bit more rigorous when we look at these spaces, we have to introduce the idea of a linear map. In this language, what we say is that a row vector maps a column vector to a scalar. To make it explicit for the scalar product, what we do is we write sp r1, dot, where the dot here can in fact represent any vector, and we say that that maps r2 to a scalar c. In this particular case, that means that we replace the dot with r2, and then we obtain c by calculating the scalar product. In this language, the row vector and equivalently sp r1, dot are objects that act on vectors in our vector space, and as a result of that action, we obtain a scalar. These objects that act on vector spaces are called linear maps. A question that we could ask now is whether there is any relationship between these linear maps and the vectors in our vector space? The answer is yes. In fact, there is a one-to-one -one correspondence between the two. For every column vector, we have a corresponding row vector that we can simply build by turning the column into a row. So that means that for every element in our vector space, every column vector, there is a corresponding element that is a linear map, the row vector. In the SP language, we say that for every vector r, there is a corresponding linear map, spr, dot. So what does this all mean? What we see is that the linear maps themselves form a collection of objects, and in fact it can be shown that the set of all linear maps forms itself a vector space. To do it, what you have to do is what we did at the beginning of this video, which is to confirm that these elements obey vector addition and scalar multiplication, which are the defining properties of a vector space. What we see now is that the dual space is simply the vector space made of the linear maps that act on the original vector space. If this last slide was a bit too technical for your taste, don't worry. All you have to remember is that for every column vector there is a corresponding row vector, and that that combination gives you the scalar product. Now that we have identified the dual space to the Euclidean three-dimensional vector space, we want to identify what is the dual space to the state space. Again, we're going to use the scalar product to make the connection, and in this case the scalar product of psi with phi gives us a scalar which is a complex number. Like before, we want to identify the scalar product as a linear map, and we write it down as sp psi comma dot, where the dot represents an arbitrary ket that in the example above is simply phi. And now we know that this linear map is simply an element in the dual space of the state space, and we're going to label it in the following way. Left angle, psi, vertical bar. So it's a symbol that in a sense is dual to the symbol for a ket in the rack notation. In the rack notation, we call the elements of the dual space to the state space bras, and you can think of them as simply doing the same thing that row vectors do in the three-dimensional Euclidean space. With the definition of an element in the dual space as a bra, we can now rewrite the scalar product in the rack notation. We do that by writing left angle psi, vertical bar phi, right angle, and we call the combination of a bra and the ket in this way a bracket.
And to be absolutely clear, what we have said is that for a cat psi that belongs to state space, we have a corresponding bra psi that belongs to the joule space, and we call the joule space V star. In the case of column and row vectors in the usual Euclidean space, all we had to do to go from one to the other was to change from a column to a row. When we want to relate a cat to a bra, there is an extra subtlety that we have to consider, and that arises from the fact that the relation between the two spaces comes from the scalar product, and the scalar product in a complex vector space is in fact antilinear in the first argument. What that means is that for a cat a psi, the corresponding bra is a star psi. If the ideas I have introduced in this video were completely new to you, then it is absolutely normal if they take a while to sink in, so don't worry. The best way to learn about new ideas is to practice, practice, practice. I use Dirac notation in pretty much all of my videos, so take a look just to get more familiar with the formalism, and once that has happened, maybe revisit this video and it will be clearer. To summarize, we have introduced state space, which is a complex vector space in which quantum systems live, and we have defined the elements in this state space as cats, and within the right notation, a cat is represented by a vertical bar, symbol, and right angle. We have also defined the dual space to the state space, whose elements are bras, and we represent them in the right notation as left angle, symbol, vertical bar. And the relationship between cats and bras was enabled by the scalar product, which tells us that the cat a psi is related to the bra a star psi and the fact that we have to take the complex conjugate of A arises from the antilinearity of the scalar product in its first argument. The final idea that we introduced is that of a bracket, which is a combination of a bra and a cat, and it represents the scalar product. What have we learned? We have introduced the idea of state space, which is the vector space in which quantum systems live. We have also learned about Dirac notation, which allows us to simplify the description of vectors in this state space. The Dirac notation is important because it allows us to make practical calculations in quantum mechanics, and this is one of the necessary ingredients to learn more about this topic. If you like this video, or you would like to send suggestions for future videos, please subscribe.